YouTube, hey there, it's Casey Dimmon here, TaxAllAcademy.com. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Tax Seller Podcast. As always, if you enjoy podcasts, there's a link down below in the video description, which will take you to TaxSellPodcast.com. Once you go there, you can download us on your favorite podcasting platform, and you can listen on the go. Let's go ahead and switch on over and record the audio podcast right now. Welcome to the Tax Sell Podcast, where tax sell investing is made easy. My name is Casey Dimon. I'm a tax sell veteran. I am the leading tax sell expert. I'm the author of the Tax Sell Playbook, founder of the Tax Sell Academy, and I am your host right here on the Tax Sell Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast episode. All right, so on today's podcast episode, I want to do something just a little bit different. As we're starting to wrap up 2020, I want to take a look back at all the questions that I received throughout this year. I went through all of them on YouTube, on Instagram, and through email. And in this episode, I wanna answer the 10 most commonly asked questions of 2020. Now, most of these, I have a much more detailed response either on this podcast or over on YouTube. But in this episode, should be a great one to get some questions answered that you likely have. And I'm gonna do that in a rather quick manner. And I've tried to group these together the best that I can, but they are from kind of across the board throughout this business. All right, the first one, what should I invest in? Tax liens or tax deeds? So without going to all the detail, a tax lien is simply a lien against a parcel of real estate for failure to pay property taxes. That lien will produce a return to the investor in the form of interest in most situations. If the property does not get redeemed before that redemption period is over, the lien holder can then foreclose their lien and become the owner of that property. Whereas a tax deed is where the actual property is sold for delinquent taxes. So knowing that, it depends on what you are looking to do. A tax lien will generally provide a lower return on your money, but it's also going to require less amount of effort to get that return. This is usually because most tax liens will be redeemed. So you will realize your profit in the form of interest when you receive a check in the mail. Mailbox money, very easy to collect. Now a tax deed will generally produce a higher amount of return but it's gonna require more effort since you must sell the property to get that return. Without putting forth the effort required to sell that property, you're not gonna make a dime. So that's the short of it. Tax liens, lower return, less work. Tax deeds, higher return, higher amount of work. It really just depends on your personal objectives. All right, next question. Should I invest in homes or land? The answer is, It depends. Both can be incredible investments when done properly. I have invested in both homes and land throughout my career, and I've done very well with both of those. Now, I've probably invested in more land, more vacant land than homes, but that's simply because many of the areas that I invest in have a higher concentration of vacant land compared to homes. The available properties in the area that you invest in will really have the most say in the property type that you'll invest in. If there are not any homes available for sale in your area, then you probably need to choose land or vice versa. With that said, you also need to factor in your risk tolerance as you determine how that will impact your investment and the specific property you're looking at. Homes will usually require more effort. You have to secure the property, right? You have to make sure the doors are locked, the windows are secured. You have to maintain the properties. You have to insure the properties and perhaps even clean them up. And that can take a lot of time. But if you're willing to invest the time, then maybe you should invest in homes. Now, something else to note here is that if the property is not local to you, that should be a big factor. It can be very difficult to take care of a house on the other side of the country where you are not able to do any of the work yourself and you have to source everything online. It's not impossible, but it does provide a little bit of a hurdle that you must cross. So in short, both can be great investments. I would not shy away from either one provided it fits your specific investment objectives. 
Another common question from this year, what is the best state to invest in? This one depends entirely on your investment objectives combined with your available capital and time and the value of that time. The truth is there are incredible deals in nearly every single state. Now, some do come with longer turnaround times than others, so it depends on what you're looking to do. My suggestion is to take a look at our state guide. There's a link to it in today's show notes section. This state guide starts off with a color-coded map, then we'll break it down to all the details in each state. Figure out what you want to invest in, tax liens, tax deeds, or redeemable deeds. Then find a state that is color-coded that matches what you want to invest in. Browse the listings in the area that you want to invest in, as well as the previous auction results. This will give you a solid indication of the potential profit margins, the property selection, the property types, and the required capital. Then you can make a decision whether it's a good area for you or whether you should continue looking. Another common question that I got this year is where do I even find out about tax sales in the first place? The best resource here is the county. Go directly to the county. Go to the website of the department in that county responsible for handling tax sales. And the name of that department could vary. It could be the tax collector, could be the treasurer, could be the clerk of the court. There are a whole bunch of different departments that handle tax sales in the various counties that we invest in. If you don't know the name of that department, my suggestion is that you call the tax collector's office and you ask them who handles the tax sales in this area. Now, once they give you the name of that department, if it is not the tax collector, locate their website and browse it. Likely they have a wealth of information that will help you get started investing in that area. All right, the next question, what's the deal with OTC tax sales? So first off, OTC sales are not offered in every state, so keep that in mind. But when a property goes to a tax sale and nobody at that sale buys it, the property is then sometimes available OTC, which stands for over the counter. This is where you simply walk into the county office, you give them a check, and you walk out as the owner of that property. It's a very, very simple process and a great way to create a near on-demand revenue stream when done correctly. To find out more about OTC sales, simply contact the county department in your area that handles tax sales and ask them what happens to the unsold properties. I also have an entire course I built just for learning about OTC investing, and that's at otcclass.com if you are interested. All right, another common question revolved around researching properties faster. A lot of people have spent time researching properties only to go to an auction and not get the properties that they had to research. So they feel like they're wasting their time. First off, if you're researching your properties and you're paying attention to what you're doing, you're not wasting your time because you're learning how to be more efficient, hopefully. But my suggestion here is to learn how to properly utilize your research tools. Go through the Property Assessor's website. Go through the GIS. Go through every other research resource that you'll be utilizing. And become ultra confident with using them prior to researching properties on your tax list. Click every single button. Go through every single search criteria so you know exactly what everything does. Once you've done that, develop a foolproof workflow. So picture a funnel. We have the large end at the very top and the small end at the bottom. Inside of this funnel, we are tossing all these tax sale properties into the large end of the funnel. Now in that funnel, we have all these different layers and each one of those properties must pass certain criteria before it goes down to the next layer. Eventually, the properties that we want to bid on will come out at the bottom of that funnel. So essentially, what you're looking at is you want to start off with the biggest red flags, right? The first thing that you can look at that you can eliminate properties. If the property is out of your budget, that's something you can look at just by looking at the tax sale list, okay? That property is out of my budget. I'll strike through it. Then the next thing you want to look at is perhaps the dimensions of the property, right? If the property is only two feet wide, it's probably not going to have a lot of value to you. So strike that out. So start off with the most obvious stuff and keep researching. And as your research goes deeper and deeper, that property works its way down through the funnel. All you're trying to do is find reasons to eliminate 
that property? Is it in good enough condition? Is it accessible? Is the value there? Look at all the different criteria that you look at, and then hopefully the property will come out in the bottom of the funnel and you'll be able to bid on it. If not though, you don't want to go through all of that stuff. You don't want to research everything only to wait till the very end to realize that, hey, the property is not usable. The property is out of my budget. The property is one of those major red flags that you should have caught on to at the very beginning. So work your research with the most obvious stuff. And then as you go down through the funnel, kind of get more and more particular on what you're looking for. So hopefully that kind of helped you out. All right, another common question this year was whether or not we should do title searches pre-purchase. The answer is I do recommend that you learn how to do title searches yourself. You can do this through public records available online in most areas. This will help you to determine which liens will be on the property when you acquire it. We'll talk about that in a second. I do not recommend hiring a title company and paying $75 to $150 to run a title search for every single property that you might purchase. That's going to get expensive real fast, especially when you don't win those properties and you'll have essentially wasted that money. Learn how to do title searches yourself. Now, speaking of that, another common question that I got this year are what liens will stay with the property after I purchase it at a tax sale? So when a property goes through tax foreclosure in most states, the liens on that property are extinguished with an asterisk there. So first off, in order for those liens to be extinguished, the lien holders must have been provided the proper notice as required by state law. If the county did not send the notice or they sent it to the wrong person or they did not send it in the correct amount of time, that lien could become an issue for you. Secondly, and the most common issue that I see that people don't understand, are that private party liens are usually extinguished, whereas liens held by any branch of the government are not. This includes federal, state, and local governmental liens. Those will usually remain and they will become your responsibility to negotiate or pay off after the purchase. Another question I got a bunch this year was whether or not somebody can file a suit to quiet title lawsuit themselves. So when a property goes through tax foreclosure, that foreclosure will cloud the title to that property, which makes it difficult to get title insurance and subsequently makes it difficult to get full market value without that title insurance. There's multiple ways to deal with this, but one of them is to go through a suit to quiet title lawsuit. This is a lawsuit that goes before a judge. So can you file it yourself? The short answer is that it depends on some specifics. If that property is in a corporation or an LLC that you own for your investment properties, it's unlikely that you can file that suit to quiet title lawsuit unless you're an attorney. Because otherwise, you'd be acting as an attorney since you're filing on behalf of a separate entity, which is your company. Now, what if the property is in your personal name? Could you file then? Well, perhaps, but why? Typically, it's to save money. So hear me out here. Every single lawsuit, whether it is filed by an attorney or filed pro se, must meet the same standards. Just because you file it yourself does not mean that that judge is going to give you any slack. He's going to expect that the documents you file will mimic the same documents an attorney would file. When you make a mistake, you will have issues. So unless you are very well versed in real estate law and specifically how to file and how to litigate a suit to quiet title, it is best to let the attorneys handle it for you. Not to mention that whether you file it yourself or an attorney files it, you're still going to have quite a bit of money and expenses and costs in the filing fees and in the court fees. The court's going to get that no matter who files it. So you likely won't save all that much money in the long run, especially when you factor in your time trying to figure out how to play attorney. So just hire an attorney to file it for you, is my opinion. Next one. Somebody will say, I've been to an auction, but everything was too much money. What should I do? Or some sort of variation of that question. The absolute key to success in this business is patience and exposure. 
You will not and you should not expect to find the success that you want at your first auction or maybe even your first five auctions or your first 10 auctions, but be persistent. To this day, there are sometimes months that pass between the time I buy properties simply because none of those properties during that time meet my investment objectives. So I'll go months without buying anything and that's okay. You must be patient. It takes time. And secondly, exposure. And what I mean by this is exposure to as many properties being auctioned off as possible. The more properties that you see auctioned off, the better your chances of success. If you see 10 properties get sold, let's say you have 10 chances of getting the property that you want. But if you see 10,000 properties sold, then you have 10,000 chances. Simple math, right? Patience and exposure. And the last question, and the most common question that I got this year was how will COVID impact the tax sale business? And that, of course, could be an entire episode by itself, but I'll try to summarize it in just a few sentences. The major impact, short term at least, is that many counties transitioned to online tax sales. And this was a trend that has been in the works for the last decade or so, but many counties hit the fast forward button once they realized that in-person auctions weren't allowed in many areas, or if they did hold them, a lot of people just wouldn't show up. So there are definitely more online sales, be it good or bad, depending on your stance. Then you have some areas that did actually cancel their sales or they just postponed them. So that obviously has an impact on us as investors, but there are many, many counties that continue to sell properties every single day and those postponed sales will be held at some point. So don't worry about it too much. Now, some states did also push back the due date of the property taxes. But it's important to realize that tax revenue is required and it's needed by the counties in order to operate within their budgets and to provide the services and amenities that they need to provide to you as a citizen. And state law will dictate what they must do when it comes to tax foreclosure. Much of this includes set timelines to meet when taxes are considered delinquent and ultimately when properties must go through tax foreclosure. And that's a very long process. It's a number of years between the time when a property first goes into a delinquent status and when that property is lost through tax foreclosure. And ultimately a few months delay or pushing back the due dates here and there is not gonna have that much of a impact on us as tax sell investors. Now, as far as tax delinquencies as a result of COVID that could lead to a potential surge of foreclosures moving forward, well, that remains to be seen. In many areas, in fact, there is no difference in the property tax delinquency rate as of right now, while in other areas, there's just a nominal difference. The long-term impact on the tax sale business is something that won't reveal itself for at least a year or two, but I certainly wouldn't count on it making a huge difference in our business, unless of course, the overall economy collapses. So there it is, the 10 questions that I was asked most often this year. Hopefully you learned a few things in today's podcast episode. Listen, I truly wanna help you get started in the tax sale business. It's an absolutely phenomenal business to be in and one that I love dearly. And I've got a number of training resources available to you. This podcast, it's a fantastic resource. Make sure you go back and review any of the episodes that you have not yet listened to. Make sure you also take a look at our YouTube channel if you want more of our free trainings. And then of course, if you want the most detailed step-by-step -step training that we offer, then you're gonna to want to join the Tax Cell Academy for access to all of the tools and the trainings that we have ever created and they're all linked down below in today's show notes section. Thanks so much again for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on the Tax Talk Podcast. See ya.